The protest has taken place outside a Presbyterian church in Belfast tonight. The protesters said it was because the church was hosting an event which promoted so-called gay conversion therapy. Our correspondent Robbie Meredith was there. No meeting of minds. There were extraordinary scenes outside Townsend Street Presbyterian Church in Belfast tonight as Christians behind a film called Once Gay about a man who, as he put it, rejected unwanted same-sex desires tried to come face to face with around 30 opponents outside, many from the LGBT community. You are just as good as us. LGBTQ, they are just as good as us. LGBTQ, they are just as good as us. I understand the struggles, really. I, uh, I also come from a homosexual background, so I, I, I understand everything that, that you feel right now. And uh, I think it's really, it would be really nice if we could, if we could speak to each other, because. We get your point, man, but that's just repetitive. We, w we would really like to, to welcome you because we do not think that we are superior to you. That's why we, we are making ourselves available to speak to you guys. My name is Matthew Grek. I'm 29 years old and I'm from the Republic of Malta. First of all, I want to thank IFTCC and Core Issues Trust for welcoming us so wonderfully in the United Kingdom and being the world's best hosts. I also want to thank Christian Concern for showing such care and protection towards me and all those who share the gospel in the public life. I want to thank my Christian brothers and sisters from the United Kingdom who have been faithfully watching and praying for us all. I honor you. I also want to thank my LGBT friends present here today. You all challenge me to examine myself and to bring out the best version of me that I can be in Christ Jesus. It is my joy today to be in Hilly, Northern Ireland and celebrate my faith in Jesus Christ and the story of how his word and power have changed my life and given me much freedom and glorious expectation. I still remember the first time God opened my eyes to recognize my infinite worth and his personal love towards me, fully demonstrated by the sacrifice of his son on the cross. I was never the same again. I said to myself, if God loves me, and wants to be my father, then I want to know him. I counted the cost and surrendered all my life to him. I got baptized and received the promise of his spirit. This journey began for me in London. On behalf of all Christians around the world and in the name of Jesus, we love you dearly, our LGBT friends. On this special day, please accept our simple gift of love to you all as a testimony that in the face of tension and opposition we can still choose to walk in God's love and in meekness in Christ. My friends and I invite you to join with us to worship God in song and watch the film as a few of us share our stories of redemption. You are all Welcome. Thank you. Only the width of a street again separated the two groups, but they were still poles apart. Robbie Meredith, BBC Newsline. Right, so I'm going to welcome Denise Schick. Um, Denise Schick is somebody I've known for several years now, over a decade. And she works, um, she runs a charity called Help for Families. And she helps families that are affected 
by transsexualism, transgenderism, as we call it today. Um, she's a Christian. Um, she's done this work amazingly, um, and, and you know, deserves a great deal of recognition. She's worked mainly in the States, but elsewhere as well, um, and has written about her own experience, um, which I'm sure many of you heard about already, um, in her book, My Daddy's Secret, and also other books such as When Hope uh, Seems Lost, and understanding gender confusion, a faith-based perspective. I know personally what um, impact she's had helping um, those with gender confusion and their families who are often very distraught um, and can be uh, um, susceptible to similar problems. So could you give a welcome to Denise Schick? It's an honor to be here with you all as I bring the southern accent with me. <laughs> um, I'm hoping I can keep you awake. I asked Ola if she'd come up here and do jumping jacks to get the blood going. <laughs> and she actually offered enthusiastically. <laughs> so, but I'll see what I can do. Uh, I would like to start off uh, with my story as early as I may. You know, as a young girl, I really didn't see how our family was different from anybody else's. Um, five, six years old, nothing seemed different or out of the ordinary. But what began to happen was about the time that I entered third grade. And as I entered third grade, all of a sudden my father had signed me up for ballet lessons without really asking if it was something that I wanted to do. He would then later on in the year sign me up for baton lessons, again not really asking if that was something that I wanted to do. And in between the lessons, uh, perhaps of ballet class, when my mother wasn't around, he would ask me to put on my shoes and dance in the living room. And it gave me a really uncomfortable feeling. I felt like I was this little performer uh, for him. But I was so young at third grade, I still could not understand what was happening. By fourth grade, uh, I started to develop very young. Now, something to understand is that I am the oldest of five children. My mother worked afternoons, so she did not, was not aware of things that had happened at home. And with that understanding of uh, my mother being sick with migraines often, I took on being the protector, the protector of mom and the protector of my siblings. So by the time I entered fourth grade, uh, that summer, my father had come out into the kitchen where I was washing dishes and asked me to come out and sit with him. I really would not ask him questions. He wasn't exactly the nicest man. I was not patient with us children at all. So I went outside to sit. And what was just seconds when he looked at me and said, I want to become a woman. And I'm trying to process this at nine years old. And before I even had a chance to understand what all that he was saying, he continued on to tell me that he had been sexually molested at the age of three. And of the experience of his brother's uh, friends that put him in his sister's dress and stuffed him in the closet. So at nine years old, I'm listening to my father's secrets. Uh, number one, he wants to become a woman. He obviously knows that I'm not going to tell anybody this. Uh, that he had been sexually molested, the experience that he had had with my uncle's peers. But in addition to that, I also knew that my grandmother was an alcoholic and that he and his father had a very dysfunctional relationship. They never got each other. So by the time he had finished with this little sharing time, I thought, why is he telling me this? I'm just a child. And second of all, doesn't he understand he's just trying to run from who he is and what he's experienced in life? I didn't think that it would affect me. I told myself it wouldn't affect me. I thought, Dad is Dad and I am Denise. We're two separate beings. But I was wrong. I immediately started to grieve the loss of my father, realizing that he didn't want children as he had shared. He didn't want to be my dad. Then who is my dad? Where can I find a dad? grieving the loss of having a father, a father to teach me of what to look for, the qualities in a man to date, or perhaps walking up the aisle when I would marry. I did not tell my mother this. 
I didn't tell a soul. I did not want my siblings to know, particularly my brothers, because I thought if they know that dad's struggling with this, would they possibly question their own masculinity and being a boy? By the time I was 11 years old, I began to question who I was. If God may have made a mistake and dad was supposed to be a girl, then how do you know you're really not supposed to be a boy, Denise? And playing that out in my bedroom and in my mind, even to the point of knowing what I would look like, how men walk, imitating that in the privacy of my bedroom. Thinking, you know, this is where we're going, where I'm going. And realizing that I had a mural of models. I always dreamed of being tall, which I'm not, and becoming a model. And so I said to myself, are you sure you don't have those girls on the, on the wall there? Because maybe you're really attracted to them. Maybe you're really homosexual. So again, playing the game in my mind and my imagination. But what began to happen very early for me is I began to bud into a young woman. And this led into a lot of resentment from my father, a lot of enviness, a lot of anger that was displaced over to me. In addition to that, it also uh, brought me into another unsafe situation with him. My mother would be at work, and my father began to create this game. The game was that he would chase me around the yard or in the house when I was home to land on top of me and to have his hands on top of my breast and squeeze them so tight that it hurt. All I could think of at that time was to him, this meant that he felt like he had breast. So I began to hate my body. I began to hate what nature was doing. As the game had carried on, finally a neighborhood lady had noticed what he had done and had let my mother know. And when she asked me about it, not disclosing my daddy's secret, but to say, yes, it had happened, do you want to go live with Grandma Elizabeth? We'll move. What child wouldn't want to move? But I soon discovered that after one week went by and the second week went by, that we weren't going anywhere. So I learned uh, very early on how to try to cope, which usually isn't the best way, is it? Uh, as far away from home, spend as many times over to my neighbors, uh, over to my friend Jody's house or Linda's, wherever it was that I could get away to. As I began to uh, start sixth grade, um, starting to notice some other changes with my dad, uh, particularly, as you might seem, it might be strange, I matured young, I was not some tiny little girl, uh, but started to notice some of my clothes missing. All of a sudden, they're behind the bathroom towels, uh, in his back seat, up in the attic. And it was finally where I had to realize what was happening, that my dad was now taking my clothes. When I would find some of those items, I would throw them in the garbage. I was uh, sickened inside and had nowhere to go, nobody to trust. I was raised Catholic. And I'm thankful for that Catholic background and that faith. But I kept looking at my mother and I thought, why don't you go to the priest? Why can't we tell somebody what we're going through? By the time seventh grade came, I learned to numb with alcohol. Any chance I had, I saved my lunch money, babysitting money. And the wine was my choice. Uh, Unfortunately, I had a friend whose uh, uncle was young enough but old enough to be able to get me that medication that I needed to mask my pain. And in this time frame, really starting to give up totally on trusting men, trusting adults. After all, if dads can't be there for me, um, you know, what's the use of trusting? There's nobody that's trustworthy. And all dad really wants is your body, Denise. Hmm. You want attention, Denise, you know how to get it. In the seventh grade, I had 13 boyfriends. Once I had their attention, and once they started a relationship, I'd drop them, and I'd be on to the next conquest, just looking for somebody to give me that love that I needed. By the time I entered eighth grade, 
I had really questioned whether life was worth living. And not just questioning it, but actually having my own plan out to end my life. I looked around and not seeing anything to live for, anything positive going on, as I would reflect day and night and hate going home because mom would be at work. And I know what was waiting for me when I got there. That to me, it was the only way out. We're hunters in Pennsylvania, and guns are nothing that uh, any child is fearful of in the parts where I lived. And so I simply had that planned. Now the thing was to come up with when. You know, God is so amazing because of his timing when we are considering self-harm or going down through something painful that we shouldn't. Uh, because at this particular time, some of you may remember, in the States anyways, a Sally Jesse Raphael. Uh, and uh, there was another host, uh, Mike Donahue. We're in the old days here. And, and they had both of these shows almost, uh, they were so close in one week that during school, uh, there were some short days. And so I watched these shows. And you know, both of these shows had a guest on that was suicidal as a teenager, but guess what? They weren't successful in their attempts. And that's what stopped me. I was more frightened that I would become like one young man and I would be paralyzed for life in my parents' house, but still being able to hear my father's voice. And because of that fear, I decided that wasn't what I was gonna do. Because if you miss Denise, if you miss and you end up paralyzed, how are you going to continue on? By ninth grade, I uh, began to think, well, you know, the alcohol really wasn't working much anymore after a couple of years and drinking like I was, so perhaps drugs was the answer. Started to hang out with some of those that did drugs and considering to go to a party and it was in this time frame when a young man, Mark, had come over and introduced himself, um, seemed interested, but by then, as young as we may be, we make promises and I swore guys off. I thought they're, they're untrustworthy, again, going with my experience with my dad, um, going with the way that I tried to use my own body uh, and to see really what men wanted at that age, young men. But Mark was different because he wanted to know me. He really wanted to know me. And I was very suspicious of that. But as time went on to have that kind of a relationship, it was the first time since I'd been nine years old that I found somebody that was trustworthy. So as time had gone on, Mark would notice, why don't you talk to your dad? Why are you so distant to him? Why don't you sit near him? You know, just honest, logical questions. And I never answered them. But one particular day, Mark had said, I'm not going to take no for an answer. I want to know why. And I honestly thought he would run for the hills. But he didn't. And he didn't look shocked. And he didn't dismiss what I had to say or the pain that I felt. We went down the road to where my home was shortly after, and we walked into the kitchen, and Mark walked into the room where my dad often un uh, reloaded or had his cameras. The two of them had spent uh, time together many times, and I was the one that was mad because I'm thinking, I just told you everything that has gone on, all the hurt and all the pain, and you're going in there and you're talking to him? I didn't have that forgiving heart yet. My heart, was, my heart was very, very hard. So watching Mark through the years of being a friend, of just being normal around my dad and not acting any different, definitely drawn interest in more about Mark and what he was about. So to fast forward you, uh, we continued to date and Mark proposed to me when I was in uh, 12th grade. And a lot of people thought we were young, and we were. 
Uh, but I have to tell you, I did not answer him immediately and say yes. And I felt bad for him, but I said, I need to think about this. Because though I was 18, I honestly felt like I was 38, mature-wise. I did not want to marry a man because I thought he was taking me out of the mess that I was in. I already had my plans. I was going to enlist in the military be able to take care of myself and not have to depend on anybody. So after some time, and, uh, and finally accepting this young man's proposal, we were preparing for our wedding a couple months after high school graduation. And I often wondered, did Dad get any help? Where is he now? Because you're still playing that the pink elephant is still sitting in the living room, that it doesn't exist because mom doesn't talk about it, Denise doesn't talk about it. But on my wedding day, if we can, we're gonna put fast forward. Oh, so sorry, thank you. Whoops. So if you can imagine walking up the aisle to meet your father, and having him turn to put his arm into my arm and to turn and to look at me and say, I wish it were me in that gown. I wanted to scream and run. But I'm looking at a church filled with family. So I did what I did so often and became so accustomed to. Just smile, Denise. Pretend everything's okay. Just smile. After our wedding, again, still pretending that that pink elephant doesn't exist, dad's not going to the bars anymore that I had heard of because I wasn't living at home. In the midst of him quietly living at home, cross-dressing and going out to the, the gay bars and wearing a red-headed wig and pretending to be a woman, I thought maybe all that subsided. Nothing was spoke of. I hoped quietly. But 10 years after Mark and I were married, my mother gives me a call and she says, Denise, can you come over? I have your brothers and your sister here and there's something I need to tell you. My dad was away at a business meeting, supposedly, uh, gone for a couple weeks. And uh, when I came in the living room, my siblings were already there in the living room. And my mother said, I have something to tell you. Your dad's leaving us to become a woman. Now, I'm the only one that's not shocked. I'm looking at, my, at the faces of my siblings because for the first time, they're hearing this. And it was very hard, especially for my brothers. My mother had asked if anybody wanted to go outside to see him, he was in the garage before we left after offering our mother our support and more conversation happening, it was actually the first time that my mother learned that he had told me at the age of nine. And needless to say, of the guilt that she felt that I had kept this in. When I went out to go see him, I was the only one that went to go see him. I like to say, and I hope I don't offend anybody here, coming from uh, Polish, uh, Slovakia roots, um, that I'm stubborn like a Polish woman. And I went out there, and as my dad turned around and looked at me, I was amazed at the changes within just a few weeks. And I told myself then, just look into his eyes, Denise. Don't look at everything else. I asked him if he would stay. Would he get some help? That we would look for a counselor, we would talk with some pastors, we would try to do some sort of intervention, looking for intervention for him. And he said, no, I'm sure of what I'm going to do. And I said, okay, then I'm saying goodbye to my father, because I no longer have one. Thirteen years went by. Thirteen years of wondering how he was doing. Um, he attempted to reach me by mail, send letters. And early on in the first year, it got to the point where I was not, I wasn't doing well. You see, I lost my dad. I grieved the loss of him at nine. And I lost him again. Only this time, it was more real because he wasn't at home with us. 
He was actually pursuing the identity as Becky. And so when uh, I refused the last letter, um, where I said to the postmaster, would you please refuse this, refuse this and any other further mail that may come, I thought I had to get myself together. I'm still trying to support my mother emotionally, who just, she just simply wasn't a strong woman. She was a strong woman of God, by golly. But emotionally, she'd been broken through the years. So another 13 years goes by. Uh, 10 years from the time that I was married, that he had left. And 13 years later, my mother calls again. She only lived about five minutes from us. She said, I need to come over and talk with you. And she came into the house. We went downstairs because I had four children at the time. And she said, your dad's dying of cancer. And I thought, hmm, okay. He deserves it. This was my hard heart. I'm just being very honest with you where unforgiveness leads us as God's people. But God didn't let me stay there. He didn't let me stay in that pitiful state. I hear him calling, you need to go forgive your dad. No, I don't. You need to go forgive I don't think so. But then he said, you'll regret it. And when I heard that, I knew it was true. I would regret not being able to go to my dad as an adult face-to-face -face over his behaviors and how things had hurt me, but also just the love on him. That was hard. You couldn't have cracked my heart with an ax. My brother and I show up and we knock on the door and guess what? When we told our mother, don't tell dad we're coming. And so he didn't come to the door, and I thought, I'm off the hook. I did what you asked, God, but he's not coming to the door, so now I can go home. And then my little tall brother said, knock one more time. And this time, I seen my father come towards the front door. And again, telling myself, look at his eyes, Denise. He can't change his eyes. He led us inside, and after about 10 minutes, I finally realized he didn't know who we were. He thought we were from hospice. And I said to him, do you know who we are? And when he said hospice, I said, no. This is your son, and I'm Denise, your daughter. For the first time in my dad's life, I seen a genuine tear, and tears come down his cheek. Now, he got up to hug us, to embrace us, which was very difficult. Um, it was difficult for my brother, uh, but more difficult for me because of the physical offenses and just guarding myself from him. I did not hug him back, but allowing him to hug me was a move in the right direction. I asked him where he was with his spiritual walk because we were concerned as his cancer was terminal, and he said, oh, I'm, I'm good. I'm good with God. But the truth of the matter was, folks, he was attending an LGBT church in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He was not good. They were enabling him and encouraging him. Within the next six months, I spent more time with my father, traveling back and forth, three and a half, four hour drive to see him as much as I could to understand more about him as an adult. And I would not give that up for anything. The last visit, I finally had some scripture to share with them, something that we all do when we have a lost loved one or somebody that's hurting or near death and you want to share something of God to them. And when I walked in the room, he was in a coma, and I thought, oh, darn. You know, he's, he's not going to hear this. And I looked at Mark, and I said, you don't know. So he grabbed a chair over by the window, and I grabbed a chair by my dad's bed. And you're remembering the hard heart I had, Correct. I'm keeping you awake, right? Okay. As I sat there near his bed, I grabbed a hold of his hand, and I felt his body going cold. And I'm rubbing his arm, covering him up, and being attentive to him at this time. 
We had to get going, but I was waiting for my other sibling to show up, my sister. We are children, if you leave teenage boys with two little sisters for all day and going into the night, <laughs> you know you have to get home. And in doing so, when my sister arrived, Mark gave me a few minutes, and I bent over, and I kissed my father's forehead. And it was at that time that I realized I really forgave my dad. And I also realized that forgiveness wasn't only for my dad to hear, but it was for my healing and where I had to go. I wouldn't give up those last five months with my dad for any amount of treasure here on earth. And being there for my mother that would visit as we would go in and people referring him to Becky and again, the Polish woman saying, you mean Harold, he, him, and to be there for my mother during that time. In and through this journey of unforgiveness, which is my favorite topic, and now you understand why, but I understand the freedom that that gives and in being obedient to God. God had continued to restore our family and use this as a real healing time for each of us. And I am so thankful for him today that he entrusted this journey with me in cleaning out my father's house, which became another difficult part of this journey. When a friend of his said uh, that was going to take care of the funeral, um, I don't want to do this. I want Denise to do it. Uh, led me just like, what in the world? I, I can't believe you're asking me to do this. But I learned more about my dad's life, and I don't know if I'll whoops, get this right. I had the unfortunate event to clean out most of his personal belongings, and I did this again to protect my mother because she was a mess. She'd been a mess since he left her. And in this, there were many different letters from my grandfather to him, uh, to my mother back and forth, and from other men that he sought relationships with. And to hear the heartbreak going on in these other individuals that were living the transgender life and the disasters of their own situations. But this one in particular, I would like to share with you because to me it shows, though my mother was weak emotionally, that she didn't allow him to totally run her over. In this letter, it reads, Dear Ruth, please read this letter very carefully. Share it with the kids if you want to. I have been thinking about the things that would still take place that we would be able to get together. I need your response to these things, for we need to do this in order to know how you feel about it and not to go into it blinded. First, how the neighbors will react to the family. Second, how long that you will allow me to shave my body. Third, how often and how long to wear nightgowns. Fourth, this is the one that may continue, this is one that may continue the rest of my life. This is in regards to wearing panties and my mother refused his offer. There's a lot of pain that happens to the families, and as we shared in today's workshop, the collateral damage that's left behind. Not everybody, as we see in reality TVs, are celebrating, or getting out the cake and congratulating somebody because they found their true identity. They're crying silently at home, and they're looking desperately for others that understand them. We need the psychologist, the psychotherapist, and I appreciate David and Richard and others that I work with that I refer to their way, because let's face it, sometimes this trauma that somebody has gone through just needs that little extra help. And other times, God brings a healing in of, his, of his own. But therapeutically, I depend on these guys. I know that they're there should I have a family that needs them. 
And for churches to stop hiding because there are many of us attending your church, no matter what religion you are practicing. And we need our church's support. Thank you.